morning. I'm bringing you greetings from your brothers and sisters in Christ in Cuba, from many different churches. They think a lot about us and they pray for us often, and I know we do the same. Um, had a good trip, and I'll be presenting. I invite you to come back next Sunday night. I'll be uh, presenting the report of the trip next Sunday night uh, during the evening service. So if you're able, please make it back for that. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about it this morning and incorporate it into the lesson. Um, but if you've ever had doubts about the work that we have going on in Cuba, let me reassure you that there's a lot of good work going on. Um, that everything that's going on, like all the money that we send, all the prayers, and all the support that we give, um, very much appreciated, and it's all very good things. So last week's lesson, Scott was here last week, he wasn't able to be here this week to present part two. Um, last week's lesson was about the shepherds, uh, the elders of the church, who they are, how they lead and support the congregation, um, and how they lead and support by example, and that the elders are supposed to be men of good character and men that are very compassionate um, toward others. This week's lesson, we're going to look at the congregation and the relationship of how the congregation is here to support the elders um, and be submissive to them. And the first passage of scripture, uh, as we look at this lesson, is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 18. This is a passage from our book. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And so this is a passage of scripture that's talking about unity in Christ as the church. So as the church, we are one church under Christ. Uh, we have many different congregations, with many different names of the congregations uh, across the world and across our country. Uh, we have many different beliefs on different doctrinal issues, but we are one church under Christ. And Christ's church consists of those who are believers who follow him and who have obeyed the gospel and been, been baptized into Christ and raised to walk in the newness of life in him. Um, we are one church. However, we do have multiple congregations. And so within the different congregations, um, God has placed people with different talents and different abilities. Um, one of the congregations that we worship with in Cuba, the main one that this church supports is the congregation of Kumaniagua. It's a very small congregation. Uh, I think it's two or three years old, if I remember correctly. And they have, uh, even with a church that small, they still have many different members that have different roles in the church that they play. Um, there's the pastor, the preacher, obviously. Um, he's the one that we actually pay for his salary. He goes out to the community and talks to the, the people in the community and the Christians there. Um, and so the pastor is, is there. The church is so small right now that they do not yet have a church. I think in Cuba there are only three or four churches that actually have eldership set up because they've grown large enough to support that. Um, so right now, I think a lot of the smaller congregations do what we do with Kumanyagwa, and it's where we work with the preacher um, and some of the elders here back in the United States uh, help guide how those churches uh, are governed in Cuba. But in Cuba, in that small congregation, uh, like I said, they have many different roles. There's one man that, um, he's the chef. We met him the first night that we went to the house, the church, and he's the one that prepares the meal every time that they have meals. Now, when we go down, um, the church buys a meal that's kind of like a treat for them. So we had kind of the classic sandwich down there, it's homoni queso, ham and cheese sandwich. And that, that is a treat for a lot of members there because they don't often get ham and cheese sandwich. Um, it was really, really a treat for them because we were able to also buy uh, a bottle of soda, lemon or orange soda for everybody in the congregation. That's something that they just don't get often. Um, so it was a real treat for them. But they have this one man who prepares the meals. And so he was the one that was in the kitchen um, you know, cutting the bread, putting all the ham and cheese on there, getting everything ready to prepare for after the service when everybody was ready to come back to eat. Now this man during the service, he didn't come out and say a prayer. He didn't come out and um, lead singing. His job, his talent, was that 
He's the guy that cooks. And so he's using his talents and his abilities to the best of what God's given him. Um, they had several others. They had others that, uh, of course, it was a small congregation, so there were some multi talented people right now. Some uh, would lead singing and also lead prayer. Um, but they still had different people that had different roles. So, similar to the letter that Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, he also wrote a letter to the church in Rome about unity in the body of Christ. And that's in Romans chapter 12. Um, I want to look just at verses 6 through 8. And somebody could read that for me. Romans 12, 6 through 8. According to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. If prophecy, use it according to the standard of one's faith. If service, in service. If teaching, in teaching. If exhorting, in exhortation. Giving, with generosity. Leading, with diligence. Showing mercy, with cheerfulness. So this is the same message that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and also to the church in Rome, talking about unity in the body of Christ, and talking about the different roles that we serve. In this letter, Paul goes into a little more detail, actually giving examples. So for me, personally, um, I can get up here and teach, and for the most part, not be very nervous about doing that, unless we walk in around at 10 o'clock uh, when it's time to start. Right, Lindsay? <laughs> Other than that, uh, I'm usually not that nervous to get up here and do that, but if I'm asked... Um, you know, on the spot to say a prayer or lead a prayer in front of the congregation. Um, I get um, probably more nervous than a, a prize turkey in November. I, it just makes me very nervous to do that. Um, so leading a public prayer isn't my gift. Now that doesn't mean I don't do it. It doesn't mean I can't do it. But it's not something I'm going to get up and volunteer to do often. Um, we all have different gifts. We all have different roles in Christ's church. Um, so the topic of the lesson this week is uh, about our different roles, the, the role that we're looking at this week and last week is the role of the shepherd or the elders of the congregation and how they support the congregation and how the congregation can support the elders. And what we read in the Bible is that the congregation is to submit to the authority and the leadership that's entrusted to the eldership. Um, so, so why would we do that? Why would we submit to their authority and leadership? Um, let's take a look at some passages of Scripture. The first one, I want to look at the qualifications for becoming an elder. You may or may not have gone over this last week. I think we'll know over the first part of it. But it's found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 through 7. And I do want to read over this. Starting in verse 2. A bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So the, one, the role of the elder is something I know that we take very seriously here at Kimball. Um, it's not something that's just a title that we give to somebody because we have some quota to fill of how many elders we need to have. Uh, the role of elder, the elder is something that's given to us from the scripture. Uh, I think one very important concept that goes along with that role of an elder in Christ's church is that elders are not perfect. So we've got this list of qualifications, but what it does not say is that elders are to be perfect. Um, Christ, we know Christ is the only man to walk the earth that was perfect, that lived a perfect life. And the rest of us are uh, human, and we have sin that enters our life. Um, elders, just like everybody else, have temptations. Sometimes, maybe even more so. Sometimes the devil um, might think the way to sneak into the church is to go through the elders. And so the elders sometimes probably have more temptations than we do. Um, maybe different, different ones than we do. Um, but for me, the qualifications for being an elder are summed up in that last verse of this passage, it says that the elder must have a good testimony among those who aren't believers. Um, he doesn't have to be perfect, but he needs to have a good testimony. So even if he falls, or even if the elder uh, succumbs to sin, he needs to repent of it, he needs to have a good, 
good um, testimony to the outside world. Uh, the example I have for that is, you know, if I tell you that heaven is a, a happy baby all the time, which he is, he's all the time a happy baby, and I tell you that, you see that, you see heaven smiling, he's smiling all the time, um, does that mean that he doesn't cry ever at home? No. I mean, in general, he is a happy baby. That doesn't mean that he's not ever going to cry, or that when he cries, oh no, he's no longer a happy baby. That's kind of the, the comparison that I have. Just because an elder may fall into sin one time doesn't mean that they are not qualified to be an elder. Um, they are humans just like we are. So one of the things that I think happens all too often, not just with elders, um, I think people a lot of times will leave the church because of somebody else's life that they're living. Um, in Cuba, one of the breakout sessions that we had, this is actually the first year that they've done the breakout sessions of the youth conference, and those turned out to be very, very successful. The kids love the breakout sessions. One of them, um, the one that I sat in on, we allowed the kids to write down questions one day, and the next day we came in, um, and several of us, we had a panel up front, and we had researched the ones that we had gotten written down, and we also allowed them to ask more questions. Uh, one of the most difficult questions I think we had came from a young girl um, it was a lengthy question, probably one of the longest ones we had, and it was the one that I got. Um, but her question really was an explanation first, and she said, I don't know if I should leave the church. I don't know um, if I should try to work out my issues with other believers or if I should just leave the church altogether. And so she was really just looking for advice on that. Um, so she was trying to, in her mind, um, I think there was an expectation that everything was supposed to be perfect when you become a Christian. And so that was basically my answer to her was, um, it sounds like there's an expectation in this question that when you become a Christian, everything's, everybody's happy, everything's perfect, um, and there aren't going to be any problems in the church, and that's just not what we're promised. Um, we've got verses of Scripture that tell us that we're to bear with one another, we're to work with one another, um, we're to love one another despite our weaknesses. And so, uh, just, like, just like with Christians, I think the same goes for elders. Just because you're appointed as an elder in the church, it uh, doesn't mean that you live a spotless life the rest of your time on earth. We need to make sure that we recognize the humanity um, of our fellow Christians, including our elders. So back to the original question that I asked. Why should we respect, obey, and submit to the authority of the elders of the church? Uh, the first reason is because they have such a high standard to live up to. It's a calling of God um, that comes with a set of standards that is higher than we can call us to live to. Um, but also... Most importantly, it's because the scriptures directly tell us to do so. If we look at two of the passages in our lesson, Hebrews chapter 13, in verse 7 and in verse 17. Verse 7 says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. And then in verse 17, again, it says, Obey those who rule over you, and be submissive, for, uh, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. For that would be unprofitable for you. So there it is in black and white from the inspired word of God. We're told that the eldership is, some, is something that God has created for the church and it's something that he wants us to be submissive to. Um, now in Cuba, that's not a difficult concept. Cuba is a communist country, so they're used to being submissive to authority. It's just a way of life over there. Um, in such a country, there are additional roles that are also important to the church that aren't necessarily um, biblical leadership roles, but because they're in a communist country, um, they're roles that exist. For example, um, one of the main guys that's he's kind of head over the church, but I don't relate him to the Pope because it's not the same thing. But in Cuba, the government that has actually appointed a man, um, he works for the government, his sole job, my understanding is, his sole job is to look over the church and make sure the churches in Cuba get what they need. His name is Emil. And there are also other Christians that work closely with him. Uh, in the region that we went to, the Kansas, there is a man named Tony, Tomito. Um, and he basically works closely with Emil for that region and also for the rest of Cuba uh, to make sure that the church has what it needs. Um, to help be a leader of the church, he's not necessarily an elder, um, but because of the way the government is structured, he is somebody that helps make sure the church is successful. Um, Tomito actually... And I'll, I'll give you details uh, next Sunday night. But Tomito, his dad was a preacher in Cuba before the revolution. And after the revolution and all that was kind of cut out, the church kind of went underground and just resurfaced uh, about a decade or so ago. And Tony's been really instrumental in uh, rebuilding the church in Cuba. Um, 
So being submissive in Cuba, not a big deal. Now, in our culture, that's kind of a hard pill to swallow. We're a free country. Um, we don't like submitting to authority. Our nation was actually founded by people who were rebelling against authority. Um, again, a personal example, when Scott first approached me about becoming a deacon, I could find several excuses why I thought I shouldn't do it. Um, I was too young, I had enough Bible knowledge of the Old Testament, this and that and the other. All kinds of excuses that I had of why I shouldn't do that. Um, but even though I talked myself out of it, that wasn't something that I could pray my way out of. Um, so it was something I prayed about earnestly um, and, and it was supported by prayer. And it was the same way for me when I was first asked to start teaching here. It was the same way when I was asked to go to Cuba. It was something that I personally tried to talk myself out of. Um, but as I prayed about it, I, I couldn't get that same resolution of, yeah, you don't need to be doing that. Um, so that's why we have elders in church. That's what the elders are here to do. The elder's job is to lead the congregation um, and to help utilize the strengths and the talents of each member for the good of the congregation. But most importantly, for the good of the kingdom of God. So in all three of my situations, I was unable to kind of pray my way out of it um, because we had elders doing what they were supposed to be doing. And the elders were seeking for people to be active in the congregation. And in the end, what I needed to do as a Christian was be submissive to this authority of fellowship, which again in our culture is something that's just not easy to do. Um, one of the best things that we have about the eldership uh, that helps us as a congregation respect them um, and be more submissive to them is the fact that the eldership is always uh, plurality. It's more than one person. Um, the eldership is not something where we set up kind of a single dictator to look over each congregation. Um, it's a group of godly men instead of just one godly man. One godly man, uh, I think you're talking in the book, one godly man could have a sin that would permeate throughout the church without having the, the forum uh, of other godly men to protect that. Um, one godly man can lead the entire congregation astray, uh, but it's much harder for a congregation to stray when they have several elders, men of God, that are following those com uh, qualifications uh, as leaders. So the relationship between the congregation and the elders is, is also much like the relationship uh, between a husband and a wife, and that's something that we read about in Ephesians, we're told wives are to submit to their husband as they do to the Lord, but it also comes with something for the husband. The husband's supposed to love their wife as Christ loved the church. And so I think in a like manner, as a congregation, um, God expects us to submit to the church elders, just as he's called the elders to have a responsibility to the church, and they're commanded to live their lives in a respectful manner. It's kind of all I have for this lesson. I got it the day before I went to Cuba and just got home a day and a half ago. So it's going to be a little short. Um, does anybody have any discussion before we close about eldership and congregation? Mark? Uh, actually, it wasn't about eldership and congregation. <laughs> the, the question that that girl wrote to you is something that, uh, you know, I've talked with a, a number of folks on, you know, as far as do they need to stay where they're at, do they need to go? And uh, I think one of the things that, that you know, the Bible speaks in, in, in many different books about where to be, you know, one spirit, one body, one mind. And what does that one mind mean? I think that, that we do have to be able to agree to disagree because we're not all 100% of one mind. Now, you know, you look at the basics, hey, who's Jesus? What did he do? Why did he do it? It's pretty important that we have an agreement on that. Uh, but I think that there are a number of things, uh, different, I don't know, topics, I don't know if that's the right word, but there's, there's things throughout our lives uh, that we view differently, and for some people it's okay, and for others it's not okay that you don't agree with me. And if the church gives off the, uh, uh, the attitude, the persona that it's not okay that you don't agree with me, well, then you don't feel like you fit in. You don't feel like you belong. And, I mean, I've been to some churches that are very, very dogmatic. I've talked to some people that are very, very dogmatic. And if you don't agree with them, you're a sinner and you're going to hell because you don't agree with them. Because they're right and you're wrong. And, and, and uh, I don't, that's, I'm, the, the fact that a young lady brought that question, uh, it, it, it's apparently she's seeing something that... Uh, it's really bothered her, and that's—it's it, sad that uh, 
that she's experiencing that at such a young age. I was, I was impressed with a lot of questions that were asked. This one was one that was interesting. And you're, you're kind of getting along to where my, my answer ended up. Uh, but what I, what I went back to with her was um, my favorite passage of scripture, Philippians chapter 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and all things with prayer and supplication, and submit your request to God. Um, but then my answer to her was basically examine yourself. A lot of times when we're in that position, um, whether it be with the church, in our marriage, um, whatever kind of relationship we have, a lot of times we're in defense mode and we're in blame mode. That person is not listening. That person is not agreeing with me. And so I read through Philippians chapter 4 and it says, um, think on those things that are pure and that are good. And so that was kind of my answer to her was examine yourself first and make sure that you're actually doing, not just not sinning, but you're actually doing what you've been called to do as Christians. Um, and in the end, if, that, if that's not the case and you're still, there's still trouble with the church and you believe that you're right, the church has other congregations. It's not that... It's a different church. It's still one church under Christ, but you may have talents and gifts that fit better than other congregations. That was basically my answer there. Anybody else have any conversation before we close? Brother Ralston, would you care to dismiss us in prayer?